<clears throat> so now, so now we come to what is it that makes one kind of monitor different from another kind of monitor? So we're talking about different types of monitors. So the type of the monitor is determined by how the monitor chooses which process gets to enter. Now look, you guys, we have basically uh, three precedences, right? Okay, capital E is called the entry precedence. So let's go back to this figure. So you see, here's the entry queue, right? And it has, because what can we choose from? We can either choose from the entry queue, okay, or what? We can choose from the what? From the waiting queue, are you with me? That's this one here. Or we can choose from the what? The signaler queue, and that's here. Now, why can't we, why can't we, choose from one, of the, from one of these condition queues. Well, th those, are, those, those are not available to choose from. Why not? Because the code in, you know, the monitor code is what, if the monitor code wants one of these guys to execute, then it should signal that and put it in the waiting queue. You see what I mean? So the program de de determines who goes, who goes from each one of these conditions to here. You can't have the monitor decide, oh, this is, take this because... Oh, maybe that was your question before. Oh, good. So that, that, I'm glad that answered that. Yeah. Does everybody see what I mean? So look, it's these three. Entry, waiting, and signaler. And we're going to denote those by the letters E, W, and S. And these are precedences. Are you with me? So look. Here, and so here's a figure. E, that's the entry precedence. W, that's the waiting precedence, and S, that's the signaler prece precedence. All right? And now look, you guys, in the paper by Boer, he actually, if you take a look at, if you figure out all the possible combinations of equals and less than, you come up with these I think this is not all of them. I think this, this is all the ones that might be reasonable. I don't remember now um, if there's 13 possibilities. But do you understand what this means? E sub P equals W sub P equals S sub P. That means they all have what? E equal, pri equal precedence, so it could pick from either one, and it's unknown which one it would pick from. But what does this mean? E sub P equals W sub P is what? Less than S sub P. So what does that mean? The Who has the highest precedence? S sub P. S. The signaler has higher precedence than the waiting, than the wait P, right? And what does this mean? This, this number three is what? The, the waiting has higher precedence than the signaler. And number four says what? The waiting and the signaler have what? Have, have equal precedence, but higher than the what? Than the entry, than, than those who are waiting to get in for the first time. Now you, so you, know, you understand that the E, the ones in the entry, those are the ones who are waiting to get in for the first time. And then we have E sub P is less than W sub P is less than S sub P, and E sub P is less than S sub P is less than W sub P, and, and all these. And, and then there are certain ones that he has just rejected out of hand. Now, why would you reject number seven? Look, what does number seven say? The entrance, the entry precedence has what? Higher precedence than either what? Than the weight and the signal, which have equal precedence. Now, why would you not want to do a monitor like that? Because can you see what would happen? Here, let's go back to this picture. Can you see what would happen if you did that? Well, People would be getting, you know, people would be getting in. These queues would get, would get filled up and people would be getting in before anybody could get out. You see what I mean? The queues here, they'd be all gummed up. They'd fill up. I mean, people would get in. I'm not going to take you guys. I'm going to take somebody who wants to get in for the first time. You'd be letting everybody in before you'd let anybody out, before anybody could progress to get out. See, so, so some, of these, they, some of these, they just don't make sense. And usually they are the ones where, where, the, where the, the, uh, entry, where the entry one is 
big, is too big. <clears throat> See, here's, here's one. These are all ones where the entry is too big, you know, and that, that's, that would just be undesirable, okay? So, so some of these are, and, and so some of these are reasonable. These, number 7 through 13, these are just rejected out of hand because they don't make sense. You, you're like, no, oh, he actually has a recommendation. I, we'll see if that's, if that's what you think. You, uh, you think number six is best? Yeah. <clears throat> you want to pick the weight, the waiter before the signaler, and both of those are bigger than the entry. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, in fact, is that what this one is? No, this one, but still, okay, so this next one is called, what Burr calls, signal and continue. And what does it mean? It says that the entrance, the entry priority is lowest of all, and then weight has higher priority to that, but signal has higher priority than the weight. So what does this mean? Let's think about what this means, you guys. If the signaler has the highest precedence of all, now where did the signaler come from? Who, where did the signaler come from? One of the processes left the Well, no. Who executes, who executes the signal C? Yeah. The, the active task, the active process, uh, the active process, the active thread. <clears throat> That's the signaler. Well, look, if the signaler has the highest, pre but what, what did we say happened? The signaler goes where? into the signal queue, and then, and, and what gets signal goes to the wait queue, and then what happens? It, well, if it's this precedence, then what happens? Who will get selected to, to go? The signaler again, right? So look. The signaler is always picked. So do you see in that with a queue that is based on E less than W less than S, you don't even really need a signaler queue. Why not? Because look, let's go back. Because what's going to happen is when the executing, when the active task executes signal C, that task is going to go in here, but then this one's going to be picked. So nothing ever gets queued up here. Do you see what I mean? So therefore, in that particular situation, the signaler is always picked because that will, there will always be one in there, namely the signaler, and so the signaler queue is not necessary. Now, are you with me on that? You see how that, how that works? <clears throat> All right, but now here's the thing. When W is eventually picked, now here comes some programming uh, here comes some implications for programming with a monitor like this. When W is eventually picked, the condition may no longer be met. In other words, the condition by which it got picked to go from here to here, because after it goes here, the signaler might be executing some more, the condition that took it from condition A to the waiting queue may no longer be met. So you may need to do, to have wait C in the body of the loop instead of in an if. I'm going to show, we'll show you this, uh, an example of this in a minute. Now, go ahead. One, yeah. You could have multiple, you could have processes that were waiting on different conditions in, this, in the waiting queue, right? So could, yes, you can. So they could change something before you get back on. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah, you could have, because after the signaler signals this guy, he could then signal another one. And, and, the, and the signal would put it in the wait queue. And then he could signal another one. That would put another one in the wait queue. So you could have, you, the, they could actually be, a queue, depending on how you program it, you could have, this waiting queue could have, could, it could have uh, processes that got put in the wait queue based on different signals. And so the condition might not be met. So you don't know, you know, when you... Now, is this the one... Uh, is this the one that you liked? Yeah. And this is the one that Ben Ari uh, proposes. This is the one that Ben Ari uses in our book. <clears throat> and what Boer calls, <clears throat> Boer calls this signal and urgent wait. Now, do you remember what Ben Ari called it? 
the immediate resumption requirement. Do you remember that phrase? But anyway, let's take a look at what, how it works. <clears throat> so this is the Benari signal and urgent wait. And what happens is the precedence for the entry queue is less than the precedence for the signaler queue, which is less than the precedence for the waiting queue. So now what this means is that when the executing process executes signal, what does it do? A guy, whatever one it signals, goes into here, and then the signaler goes into the signal queue, but then who gets picked? The waiting queue. So therefore, this never has, this never accumulates, right? So look, it's this, so here. The signaled is always picked. The signaled, not the signaler, the signaled is always picked. And so there's no, there's no need for a waiting queue. So really, these, these kind of mon monitors only, have, only need a signaler queue. Are you with me? And then once this queue, once the monitor becomes available, and there is, and once the monitor becomes available, who will, who will get picked? S as opposed to E, right? The signal, the one who did the signal, he'll execute before someone new can come in. Yeah? So that's signal and urgent wait. So what? Yeah, question. What does the entry queue represent? Well, the question is, what does the entry queue represent? That's a good question. What it represents are, it represents processes. Now, what is a process? It's a program during execution. So it represents processes. In other words, threads that are executing concurrently. Are you with me? And what they have done is they have called a method in the monitor. They have called a monitor method. But there's another process executing a monitor method. And because mutual exclusion is guaranteed, they have their stuck in the entry queue. Now, are you with me on that? That was a good question. You got, you got that visualized? Mm -hmm. So they, they, have, they, have, they, have caught, they have they have wanted to do some monitor method, but someone's in there, so they're blocked on the entry. Yeah. Is everybody does everybody see what that is? So because the signal is always picked, the waiting queue is not necessary. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> in this situation, you can have wait C in the body of an if statement. Now how, why can you have wait C in the body? Why do you not need a loop? You can have wait C in the body. Why can you have a wait C in the body of an if statement? Be, because if you wait on that condition, sorry, if you if you signal that if you signal that condition, that one that one that's in the condition Q is going to take over right away. Nothing can. There's no interleaving. No interleaving can happen in between. See what I mean? No other process can, this, even the signaler, even the, even the one who does the signaling gets blocked. Okay, so you can have wait C in the body of an if statement. However, signal C should be the last statement of operation. And that's a guideline. I'm going to show, we'll show you examples of this, of these guidelines in some code. Why wouldn't you be able to have wait in the body of an if statement in other cases? Or because of this, because, let's go back. Because what happens is, when you, when, when the signaler, when the signaler signals, says, oh, now, now it's okay, for, it's, now the, it's, it's okay to have this guy start up. But on, unfortunately, this guy's not going to start up right away. He's going to be put in the wake queue, and the signaler is going to keep executing. And if the signaler executes some more, then and you're not really careful with your, if you're really careful with your code, you can you know, consider all these other possibilities. But best practice is, because the signaler is, is, could do some things, then um, the, condition, the, the code might change the condition under which, under which the um, signaled got put into the waiting queue. So you want like while condition is not Yeah, I'll, sh I'll show you. I, yeah, I will show you, uh, we'll, we'll see some code. We, we actually, we'll see these guidelines in some code in a, in a minute. You'll see. 
<clears throat> okay? So, Benari, signal in urgent wait. Signal is always picked. Waiting queue is not necessary. <clears throat> and you can have wait C in the body of an if. However, signal C should be the last statement of an operation. We'll come back and visit that in a minute. And now, you guys, here comes the... <laughs> here comes... Here comes something that a lot, a lot of people don't appreciate very well. Look at this. This is Java. This is how Java does it. Now watch this. The, pre the precedence for Java, it's called wait and notify. Now look at what, it, look at how the, look at what the Java one is. It's E equals W. Now what, how, what does it mean E equals W? That means who, who has, I mean, suppose somebody's in the waiting queue and wants to get in, but there's also someone in the entry queue. What does this say? They have what? Equal precedence. Are you with me? So that means if you're waiting, you have to contend with the people who are in the end, who are trying to get in for the very first time, even though you've been in there. Tough luck, buddy. You've been in there. Go back to the go back to the opening door and mix in with the are you with me? And furthermore, that's less than S. So so because it's because S has the highest precedence when the signaler signals, what do we not need? We don't need the signal queue, but there's more. Because the signaler is always picked, the, the, we don't need the signaler queue, right? But, <laughs> now this is not in the, this, I modified the figure in the paper. The paper doesn't show this, but <clears throat> this is to illustrate Java. Not only that, but Java, what does it say down here? There are no what? There are no condition variables. Java monitors, do, Java does not provide condition variables in their monitors. So you don't even have the condition variables. So there's no Qs here. And furthermore, because E equals W, it's like when this guy here, I, we illustrate here, when, when, when the signaled goes in here, where does he wait? Brrr, he goes through this little tube. This is like a little hamster tube. Brrr, brrr, brrr. And now he's mixed in here. And he's mixed in with all those ones in the entry. So the signaler is always picked. The signaled waits, and the signaled waits in the entry queue, and there are no condition variables. So this is the picture of the monitor the way Java does it. Oh, now I know why it's called Java. The figure looks like a coffee. Looks like a coffee. Oh, there you go. It does look like a coffee machine. That's why it's called Java. Is that pretty much a mutex semaphore? Well, it's a monitor. No. It's a no, no, a, because Java has semaphores, and a binary semaphore is like a mutex. So, so you can do, well, you know, there's, all, there's always similarities. You can always, any, any monitor, you know, you can do with them, you can make a semaphore with the monitor, you can make a monitor with a semaphore, so they all have similar characteristics. Okay? But let's, let's take a look. Let's take a, look, a closer look now then at, at how Java works. So with Java, it's called wait and notify. Okay, that's the phrase that Boer uses. And it's E equals W is less than S. And furthermore, now, now, because you're going to, uh, your last assignment, you're going to use Java monitors, right? So you're going to use this code. Wait C is called wait in Java, and signal C is called notify in Java. Now you will usually do notify all. Because notify all moves all processes from the waiting queue to the entry queue. So you usually just, if you're going to notify, you might as well just notify all. All right? And the signaler usually executes notify all, and the waiting, and the waiting processes loop on their Boolean expressions. Because how do you know which one's going to get in? Well, you have to have, uh, we'll, we'll show this. The waiting processes loop on their Boolean expressions, and then and then that determines how they get in. Now look, you guys, let's go back to Sestoft. Now I want you to see if you can see, I want to see if you can see that this picture from Sestoft is exactly, it's precisely 
this figure. Now let's see if we can understand that. You see what I mean? You see here, this is E equals W less than S, and this is the, this is the mechanism that happens whenever you do a um, wait, okay? Or whenever you signal, okay? Okay, so, okay, so check this out. It's so. Here we are. This is our Sestoff uh, state transition diagram for the state of a process. And we had, we've, we've looked at some of these states before. We looked at joining, you know, uh, joining and then enabled is our ready state. It's, it's in the ready state. And so now, the running process, when the running process executes wait, so O is the, is the uh, process that's running. That's a process. And when we do O dot wait, then what does that, what, the, what does that do? That puts, that puts in this waiting for O. And then when you do O dot notify all, either O dot notify or O dot notify all, then it goes from waiting here into here, into this locking O, which will eventually go into enabled, which then can be scheduled. All right? So this is, and, and this is Java precisely. This is precisely the cues that are, and how you make a transition to go from one to another. And it's complicated, and we can't get into these, we, we don't have time to get into all these details about locking and such. But we'll do, I'll show you some example code about how, to show you how to code uh, a Java monitor. And now look at this. Here is, a, I took a quote from the paper. You might detect that I have a small anti-Java concurrency bias in this presentation, but it's backed up by this, by the quote in this paper. E equals W is criticized by Boer, this paper that we're, we are studying. In all cases, the no priority property, now what does he mean by the no priority property? E equals W. Hmm? For a long time or what? You, right. No matter if you've been in, you get mixed in, you get thrown in with those in the entry. In all cases, the no priority property complicates the proof rules, makes performance worse, and makes programming more difficult. It's not like there's a trade-off, you know. Oh, well, maybe the performance is bad, but the programming is easier, or maybe the programming is easier, but the performance is bad. There's no trade-offs. It's all negative. There's no redeeming features, <laughs> according to Boer. There's no reason to do this, to do it this way. Therefore, we have rejected all no priority monitors from further consideration. And they just say, look, we've analyzed the situation thoroughly from all these different, from these three different aspects. You know, the proof rules, the performance, and the programming. Those three metrics of what makes a good monitor. And Java, this stinks. And we're not even going to consider it. He didn't say stinks, but. We're not even going to consider it. And, and here's the thing, you guys. I, why did it, why did things evolve this way? I'm going to, here's a story about why Java turned out this way. Back in the day when Java was new, there were competing programming languages and there were competing systems. And do you know who invented the Java language? Is an individual. Does anybody know his name? His name was Gosling. And you know what company he worked for? Have you guys heard? Actually, this might be before your time. Do you, have you guys heard of Sun Computing? Or Sun, was it Sun Incorporated? Or Sun? Microsystems. Oh, was it Sun Microsystems? It might have been. I don't even remember now. But they got bought out by, do you know who bought them out? They got bought out by Oracle. And that's why you download Java from Oracle now. Are you with me? And, so, and they actually, not only did Java make, they made uh, servers. They made uh, internet servers and workstations. They, they made really, they, they developed a, a chip called the Spark chip. It was a RISC chip, one of the early RISC chip, uh, chip designs. And they had this language called, they, they, had, they, they had this Java. 
And this was when the internet was first starting to take off really big and people needed a programming language to program for the internet. And unf there's, a, there's all kinds of stories about how Java got happened. And it was basically what it was, the story that I keep, that I have heard is that it was, it was between the engineers and the marketers. And the engineers, the marketers said, give us Java, give us the runtime, give us this thing right away. And the engineers said, we're not ready yet, we're not ready yet. They said, we need it, we need it, we need it for the market. They said, look, this isn't ready, but here's what we have so far. And what happened was the marketers took that, and even though, and the engineers knew that things needed to be like adjusted, but man, the marketers knew first to market and the network effect. Once people start using it, then more and more people use it. And it just took off. And from what I understand, the engineers never were happy about, because they gave them kind of like an unfinished project. But once it got established, they didn't want to break, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to change it because by changing it, all these people's code would stop working. And there has been, there's been, I, I've got papers that, critis that, uh, not o that not only criticize the monitor implementation, but can, can criticize the runtime, uh, the Java virtual machine. It's the concurrency model of the Java virtual machine. And I'm not sure how, how much that has been corrected or what, but, but this is the model. This is, I mean, at the hardware level, but this is the, at a lower level of abstraction, but this is the Java, the Java model, okay? So that's the story of monitors. Now, okay, we're going to end this uh, recording by doing a little screencast to show an implementation of a counting semaphore in C++ using the C++ monitor uh, features. And we'll start off by noting that semaphores and monitors are equivalent in power. In other words, anything you can do with a semaphore, you can do with a monitor. And anything you can do with a monitor, you can do with a semaphore. They both solve the critical section problem, but in different, slightly different ways. F and from that, it follows that you can construct a semaphore with a monitor, and you can also construct a monitor with a semaphore. <clears throat> so that's exactly what we are going to do. We're, what, what we will show you next is given a monitor how to construct a semaphore. So this next slide, algorithm 7.2 from our textbook, shows Benari's implementation of a counting semaphore using a monitor. And re remember now that um, Benari uses the horse semantics as opposed to the Mesa semantics of C++. And here's the code for implementing a semaphore using a monitor using the horse semantics. So if you look at P and Q, it seems as if process P is executing a program using a semaphore. In other words, there is a non-critical section for P, and then P1 executes sim.wait as if sim is a semaphore. And then there is a critical section, and then P2 executes sim.signal, again, as if it were a semaphore, and the same for Q. But then when we see up on the top part of the figure, monitor sim, this is a monitor that simulates a semaphore using these characteristics of a monitor. And what, when the um, process is executing sim.wait, the monitor has provided operation weight to do the same thing that a semaphore would do. And when the P2 executes sim.signal, the monitor provides an operation signal, a function signal that does the same thing that a semaphore would do. And so let's trace through this code a little bit and see how it works. Okay, so first, suppose P1 executes sim.wait before Q1 executes its sim.wait. Well, when p1 executes sim.wait, operation wait is, e is um, executed. And the first statement in operation wait is if s equals 0. Well, what is the value of s? Well, s is initialized to k. Now we are assuming for this implementation that k is 1, so that the semaphore that is uh, 
implemented is a binary semaphore, like a mutex. So we will assume that k equals 1 at the beginning. And so the statement if s equals 0 is false. And so process p does not wait. It simply executes s gets s minus 1 and returns and goes into its critical section and goes into its critical section. But now, but now it because it has set s equal to 0, if q tries to execute q1, it will call sim.wait. But now in sim.wait, operation wait will first test if s equals 0. And now s will be equal to 0, so q will be blocked by the execution of the wait c, the wait of for a um, for a monitor, the monitor weight, on the condition variable not zero. And S and it will not execute S gets S minus one. Then when P finishes its critical section and executes P2, P will execute sim dot signal. Well what does sim dot signal do? It does right off the bat S gets S plus one, which returns S from zero to one, and then and then it executes the monitor signal C on the condition not zero. But now that, and so now P, and so now the next statement that will be executed in P will be P1 and it will be out of its critical section. But now what happens is because it signaled C, be, because it signaled not zero, it did a signal C on not zero, the effect of that is to unblock Q from the condition Q on wait C and Q will be able to execute S gets S minus 1 and enter its critical section. And so you see this behavior simulates a semaphore. Okay, now let's consider what the code would be like if instead of having a monitor with horse semantics, we have a monitor with Mesa semantics. So here's the code for the implementation with Mesa semantics. And it differs from the code with horse semantics in one small detail. Namely, in operation wait, with horse semantics, the code is if s equals 0, wait c not 0, whereas with the Mesa semantics, the operation is while s equals 0, wait c not 0. Now, why do we have this difference? Let's consider again what happened when Q was blocked and P was about to execute P2 and call sim.signal. So recall then that the value of the semaphore integer was 0, so when P executes sim.signal, it says S, it says S gets S plus 1, which increments it, the, the count from 0 to 1. And then it executed signal C not zero because it knows that S is n is not zero. And what that did because it, because Q was in the condition Q and got signaled, that means that Q was was able to get out of the condition Q. And because the monitor uses horse semantics. It is guaranteed that the condition not zero is true because, because Q resumes immediately after being unblocked from the condition Q and executes S gets S minus one. On the other hand, with Mesa semantics, when P executes sim dot signal, it will unblock Q from the condition Q but Q will not be the one that continues to be executing. Instead, P continues to be executing. And therefore, we cannot guarantee, well, in this particular example, we might be able to guarantee it, but in general, we cannot guarantee that when Q finally executes S gets S minus 1, that that, that, that condition, not 0, will be met. And therefore, best practice is to put the wait C not zero in the body of a while loop instead of in the body of an if statement. So this is an example of the guidelines that we enunciated in the monitor characterization discussion. The difference between horse semantics and Mesa semantics. 
Okay, so now let's look at some C++ code to actually implement accounting semaphore in C++ using the monitor uh, features of the language. So first of all, uh, we, need, we are going to have to execute signal and wait. And signal is uh, pretty straightforward because it uses the lock guard for mutual exclusion. Do you remember how that worked? That, that was the C++ RAII uh, coding pattern. The resource allocation is initialization. And so it uses a lock guard the same way that we used the lock guard in algorithm 7.1. On the other hand, the wait method is a little more complicated because it uses a condition variable. And so when you have a condition variable in your, that you want to implement in your monitor, instead of using lock guard, you have to use unique lock, which does the same thing that lock guard does, plus it has the additional capability to give a condition for a condition variable on which to wait. And also notice then that wait takes two parameters now, a unique lock, as well as a predicate that must be true to unblock the process. So let's take a look at the C++ code. So here we have class semaphore. And we have our private int s. So that's our usual integer count to simulate the count of, the sem of accounting semaphore. And now we have this new variable condition underscore variable which is a C++ built-in condition variable type and we of course are naming our condition variable not zero to match the code that we that was given to us by our author in algorithm 7.2 and then we have our usual mutex to guarantee mutual exclusion so that our weight and our signal will be executed atomically with no interleaving and then our constructor for our semaphore ha takes an integer k, and our integer s is initialized to k by the constructor. So now if we look at, s at our signal method first, void signal, that's the simplest one, the simpler of the two. And we have our usual lock guard with a template uh, parameter mutex, a mutex, and we, we call it guard like we did before, and we give it our sim mutex. And then we do S++, which is our S gets S plus 1 from our uh, Benari text. And then we just do, and now the way we do signal is, the, the, no, the notation for that is not 0 dot notify 1. So notify 1 is the method of, the, of a condition variable. That's one of the standard methods of a condition variable. And because um, not zero is is a condition variable. It can execute this method notify one for signaling. Now let's look at the code for wait. So now instead of using a lock guard with a template type mutex, we have a unique lock template type mutex. And again, we give it our sim mutex. We na we name it guard like we did before, and we give it our sim mutex. But now, there is a wait method for a condition variable. And our condition variable is not 0, so we say not 0 dot wait. But now you see, instead of taking two parame one parameter, it takes two. And what it takes is, first it takes our guard, which is linked to simutex. And then it takes a predicate. Now, do you remember what a predicate is? What's the definition of a predicate? Predicate is a function that returns type Boolean. And we, here we are using a functional programming feature of C++. This is the syntax for a lambda expression. So you remember when we did a uh, scheme and we had lambda. We had the lambda was the way we declared a function. This is precisely like our lambda functions that we declared in scheme. And so this is a one-line function, open brace, return, s not equal to zero, semicolon, close brace. So that's, our one, that's the one line of our function. Now the square bracket with this and then close square bracket, 
that is used to capture the environment for the code inside of our function. Because the code inside of our function refers to s. It says return s not equal to 0. So the only way the compiler can understand what s is is if we tell it the environment from which to select s. And so this is a pointer to the current class which includes int s in the private part of this class. And so without the square bracket this, the compiler would not know where to search for s. So this lambda expression is basically, basically what we are doing is we are passing the, this function as a parameter to, to the weight method, to, to non-zero dot weight. But now wait a minute something appears to be missing here. I thought that we had to do our weight in a loop, but there does not appear to be a loop here. So what's going on? I thought we needed, we know that this is Mesa semantics, where is the loop? Well, the answer to that mystery is in this, is in this next slide. So the C++ community refers to the problem of Mesa, with Mesa semantics as the spurious wake-up problem. If you go to like um, Stack Overflow and you Google around, you you know you search around for for uh, C++ uh, semantics and problems and issues, they'll talk about people on there will talk about the spurious wake-up problem. And the spurious wake-up problem comes because the C++ designers like Boer, the author of our paper many years ago, recommended, they took his recommendation and implemented their uh, condition variables with uh, Mesa semantics, in which case E is less than W is less than us is less than S, and the signaled is unblocked, but the signaler is the one who continues, and therefore we cannot be guaranteed that when the signaled finally starts to execute later, that the condition will still be true. Because another process may have changed the value of the expression between the signal execution and the resumption of the waiting. So here's what they did. They actually built in to the wait statement the loop, the spurious, they call it the spurious wake up loop. And so when you actually say wait unique lock and you give it a lock and then you give it a predicate, a, a pred of type predicate, in other words a boolean, behind the scenes this is equivalent to, if you look at the specification this is equivalent to while not predicate wait lock. So they, so the designers of the C++ language built in that while loop so that you so that even though it's not visible in the code that's what it is doing behind the scenes and so what is visible without this feature is now hidden with this feature so there is actually the while loop is actually there but you just can't see it in your code so Here's a little dis more discussion about the C++ Lambda syntax. So the square bracket, what's inside the square bracket is called the captured variables. And then we have parentheses, parameters, and then we have brace function code. Now, we did not have the parentheses um, for the parameters uh, in the example. So, so they are optional. So in class semaphore, Square bracket this allows access to the class to class attribute s in the function code as we described earlier. And if you also have a local variable that you need to access in your function, uh, you can always include that local variable in the capture brackets in the in the capture square brackets. And so, and, and here's why you can omit, omit the parentheses. This is more information about the C++ Lambda syntax. So in class semaphore, the function has no parameters, and so you can omit the parentheses. So that's just an option to keep the code 
a little bit shorter, a little bit cleaner. So look, you guys, we are actually using functional programming. This is a, quite a, an interesting development. And most modern, lang most modern programming languages now have uh, embraced the f many of the features of functional programming. When we learned Scheme, we, we learned pure functional programming. That's the only thing that we did in Schemes. But now these, these uh, features are becoming, in, are becoming incorporated in other, in other programming languages. And so here's an example in Scheme. If you say Lambda, N, and then star, N, N, close paren, that is, that is the square function, but it does not have a name. And then we, when we say define square, and we give it the function to, to, that is linked with name, then we can say square 5, and that will give us 25. You can actually do the equivalent thing in C++. You can say function, and then angle bracket, int, int. So it returns an int, and it takes an int as a parameter, and, and we can call it square. And then we can define square to be square, and then using this uh, lambda notation, open br square bracket, close square bracket, parentheses int n, which is the parameter, and then return n star n. Then we can say c out square 5. So now you see C++ now is mimicking scheme, functional programming everywhere. And so now here's a little bit, uh, here's a little more information about lock guard versus unique lock. So the constructor for both lock guard and unique lock lock the mutex, and the destructor for both lock guard and unique lock unlock the mutex. However, if you're going to have a if you're going to wait on a condition variable, you you must use unique lock, and if necessary, the programmer can also actually directly lock and unlock a unique lock by saying guard dot lock, or guard dot unlock. Okay, so that ends this presentation. See you next time.